quick introductions, we'll save time. Monty Taylor, who is as bad as Mr. OpenStack as you can be, he's on every possible OpenStack committee there is. I, I think you're on every I'm all of them. <laughs> I'm on all of them. Um, so he's really a solid lead when it comes to OpenStack. And, and Mr. Tom Norton, who leads our, um, what's called the HP Helion OpenStack Professional Services. There's a contest now with HP Helion to see who has the longest product name, service name. I don't know. Oh, I didn't know about that, that, that contest. It's on. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm well, the shortest. HP Helion <laughs> Development Platform. <laughs> so they keep getting longer. So, you know, we have engineering expertise, OpenStack expertise, and expertise coming from our best you know, our largest customers working with Enterprise 50. So I thought we would do to start this off, um, I had a discussion with some folks last night. Before you guys jump into questions, please feel free to jump in and use that one Twitter stream so we can save the conversation and promote it afterwards. Is I've asked uh, Mark to start with the difference between HP Helion OpenStack, HP Helion OpenStack community. community. And, and, oh, I apologize, I, I didn't introduce you on my... Yeah, do we need me to... So yeah, I'm, go ahead real quick, I'm, I'm sorry. Louise Ng, I'm the uh, worldwide CTO for Cloud Hybrid Delivery on the services side for HR software. So I, I apologize, so we even have another professional services, I apologize. That's so right. Mark, why don't you go ahead and go, and then guys from there, don't be shy, because I know this is a group of introverts, so please, <laughs> you know, feel free to talk. So maybe I'll just kind of briefly talk about the, yeah. the, the two things we offer. So uh, we have the, the Helion OpenStack Community Edition, which we release about every about every six or eight weeks. We basically take the latest stable bits from the community, uh, put that together, package that up, make sure we're running through our our, our, our standard Q, QA and regression tests, and we that's where it's kind of six to eight weeks. We get we get a point where it's it's stable and we're happy. We cut that and we kind of drop that off uh, available to the community as the kind of the latest upstream uh, kind of core community work. That then is part of a process that feeds into uh, building our enterprise product, which has got uh, more elements to it. It has uh, a more sophisticated installer. It has more integrations with uh, HP, so HP hardware and other elements built into it. And so it's a much, it's designed to be more scalable. It has a, with its installer, and maybe Monty can talk in a minute to, yeah. to a little bit about how that part works since that's part of his team. Uh, and then that really becomes the, the basis for what we build out and, and sell as the, the enterprise product. And then the installer is your work. Yeah, uh, and, and in, in both of these, uh, we're, we're using the, uh, the upstream Triple O technology to, to put uh, put installer on the ground. Triple O itself is, is sort of just a, uh, a, a, at its heart, it's a, the approach of using um, uh, using a, a bare metal based cloud uh, as the as the underlying basis for for installing and running a cloud, uh, which is which is a lot of fun and, and makes your brain hurt sometimes. Um, but it, but it's really great. It, it allows us to give uh, give the ops guys, the guys that are there with their with their hands on the metal, the same uh, uh, the same flexibility, the, the same power that we're giving to the app developers. You know, it's, it's great that you're writing an app that you know. Uh, that, that you know runs Angry Birds or whatever, but uh, but actually, if you're if you're deploying that complicated app called called Cloud, you you want those same tools, you want those same uh, those same features, and so we we've been working um, you know with the community on, on doing that. It it turns out that that stuff is hard. Um, so so the, the the way that we approach that in the in the community enterprise um, editions is is a little bit different because doing a doing sort of a, a, a quick and easy. I'm gonna I'm gonna spin up a few. A few servers uh, type community deployment isn't as complicated as hey I want to install a data center <laughs> of uh, you know a data center of clouds. So we've got to we've got to shape those things differently so that there's a, a different experience for the uh, for the end consumer. Um, hey, I've got a quick question. Um, can you go from smoothly from the community edition to the enterprise edition? Define smoothly. Um, no uh, the the. Honestly, the this is one of the reasons that we've we've got a we've got a product line. Like OpenStack itself is a is a is a you know fresh and, and fastly moving uh, fastly moving set of software a set of technology. So it's um, smooth usually doesn't doesn't enter into it in, in, in the early ways, and that's that's what we're that's what we're we're, we're delivering to customers each of the products. And you can you can definitely go from uh, from from community to, to enterprise. But it's, this isn't a, this isn't a go push a button and all of a sudden boom I've got a I've got an enterprise. There's going to be a work you know you may have to bring in uh, you know Tom and his guys to to help you with that transition. But but it's certainly it's not a 
um, you shouldn't take your have to take your, your community cloud and throw it away and, and start from scratch. Right. Because do you see very many yeah. customers and potential customers of enterprise that start out with the community edition? Uh, <coughs> hey, it's just test dev, right? Yeah. And like everything, test dev. Somebody running tier one production mission critical on it, and you're like, how did that happen? Yeah, I'll, I'll put that one over to, to Tom. Are we, are we seeing much of that in there? Yeah, actually, we yeah, are. Because I think what, what people are starting with is a particular workload. Because it, you want to be able to insert this into, especially in the enterprise, into an operation that, that already exists. So they're going to have VMware, they're going to have Microsoft or something else. They're doing virtualization, they've been working with cloud for a while. So they want to test something against this new platform just to see how the workload would perform prior to inserting something new into their environment. So yeah, they're, they're going to start with community, they're going to keep it isolated. And the, the reason it doesn't necessarily flip that easy is because when you get to the enterprise side, you start having to look at, at the adapters to kind of move into all these other component pieces that are part of their environment, and how do you blend in you know, the enterprise version of this or you know, the, the open site version of it so that it fits well. But you want to look at the workload first and, and try to evaluate how is that going to perform on an open site platform. And community is a great way to do that. And it doesn't matter the size of the companies. You've got big telecom companies in Asia that are looking and starting with community, kind of tuning that, tuning the workloads, because they want to be able to provide workloads as a service. So who are your main potential customers then? Because you mentioned big telecoms, right? Um, but are you seeing more around like the SME showing interest as well? And uh, more traditional enterprises like you know, finance and retail? Well, I guess the easy answer is yes. So I think. It, people are approaching it in a couple different ways. The, the, the service provider, telecoms now are becoming service providers because it's giving them a revenue stream. And what they try to build out is that, that ecosystem that says, what can I easily introduce workloads into that I can, I can push out as a service out to new customers so I can engage new customers, even individuals. So I can, I can push services out to 300 businesses, but if I want to address individuals, it's going to be 300,000 individuals or 3 million. So how do you how do you scale this ecosystem to be able to support it? And, and things like Helium give us the ability to do that. So they are looking at that from a service provider perspective. But manufacturing is looking at it because they have you might have 20 clouds that support different product suppliers in manufacturing. Healthcare does it because they want to scale storage. Retail does it because they want to scale storage. So we're seeing it all over the place. But arguably, I mean, community edition is still really new. I mean, yeah. it's only a matter of what how many months old now. Yeah. 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 So what how, So how does this play out? So I understand community edition. I understand the commercial product. It's called what enterprise edition now. Okay. So I understand the differences. In, but the piece I'm still struggling to get my head around, and this is an open stack problem, is how do you upgrade? So you get started, right? And if we look at kind of the history of how people have been using open stack to date. You've got a number of folks that are still one or two reps back because there is no such thing as an upgrade in open stack, right? It's a, it's a whole reinstallation. Where does community edition and enterprise help me with well, that? Let's, let's, I, I, maybe not community edition, but go to enterprise edition. Okay. So there are people that upgrade. Uh, uh, well, it's not an upgrade. Well, I've, I've, been, I've been running the uh, Before this gig, I used to run Rackspace's public yeah. cloud. We upgraded that every week. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't take it down. HP is the same HP's one. HP's cloud, same thing. These yeah. are both continuously deployed and continuously being very, period, very highly periodically deployed systems. Okay. And so they don't go down uh, for upgrades. We've kind of perfected that at the service provider level you know, over the last 18 months or so. I, I guess I'm thinking more, I mean, to yeah. be fair, talking more of the process to do the upgrade, right? Yep. If, I'm, if I'm using it. So we, uh, the, the Enterprise Edition does, does upgrade. <laughs> coming out with our, our next version you know, pretty soon, as we always do, and that'll be the first one that's kind of got the upgrade capability built into it. Yeah. But, but like I said, that, that's a, it, it's, it's, a, it's, one of, it's one of those areas that we're able to, you know, because of our operational experience, uh, actually actually provide value to customers. Because you're right, it's like the OpenStack community in, in general, we're, we're working on making upgrade better. Like there's things that, that upstream has to do, right? Like making sure that there's cross uh, cross-version compatibility between internal object versions and stuff like that. You've got to be able to run a Juno version of the Nova compute nodes with the Icehouse version of the controller and stuff so that you can do a rolling. That's also, upstream has to do that engineering work and, and that's been a, a real big focus. That still doesn't mean the process of taking a thousand nodes and upgrading them is ever going to be 
easy just out of the box from, from an upstream open source uh, thing, which which then gives up us an, an opportunity to, to help our uh, you know our customers and our, our partners to to give them the tooling, give them the process and, and the ways to, to actually make that uh, work so they can run that and, and not have their business go down. So our vision is that it's dramatically more seamless than it is, is yeah. today and has been, so that you've got to tell you what there's there's the next version, version two of the thing is out there, or these subsystems do you want to install? Yes, it finds the right time and quiesces machines, brings up the new instances and you're up Because arguably that's one of the big hurdles today yes. with the stack, right? Yes. Box. And not to be contrary to your role, but I don't want to have to pull consulting in when I'm doing that, right? I want to be able to... The customers are going to have to have a release process regardless, so sure. it's no different than any application. They still have to follow a, a standard process of releasing into their environment. I agree with that. I mean, to me, that statement is motherhood now. Hi, I'm saying the details. The devil is in those details. Sure. What is the process that I have to go through and which right. to do? Right? Well, and that's the piece that, frankly, OpenStack is kind of struggled with, right? Well, because it's still, I, I think, still a bag of parts. So, wait, here, actually, right? let me. So, the thing is, is that. Not, open, if, yeah. To be fair, no. I'm not talking about Enterprise Edition, I'm talking yeah. about. Open stack itself. The, the right. classic open stack yeah. itself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. but if you think think about what open stack is and, and what it's trying to deliver, right? It, it's actually um, all of all of the, the the other things. Like if you're if you're Twitter, if you're if you're Facebook, if you're Google, um, you don't ever ship that code, right? You have you you deploy that code, and there's only ever one version of that code, and and you have a DevOps organization that's 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 organized around doing continuous delivery of Google. Right. Actually, many many DevOps organizations <laughs> organized around around doing that. Uh, OpenStack's trying to give you software that can run at that scale, so you can run a a you know a a world size cloud, and also give you something that you can put in a box and, and hand to somebody. Like that's that in of itself is not not particularly uh, uh, with a lot of precedent. Um, but it's also because it's bringing that sort of you know. Google Facebook style DevOps. We're starting to actually be bringing this to the uh, to the enterprise. Part of this is actually about you know we're, we're are talking about real IT transformation. This isn't just lip service. People are going to have to learn, uh, going to have to transform their business processes around. Okay, I'm not just going to install this once and in three years I'm going to upgrade it. That's not it's, workable it's, in, it's in the new IT. Agile. It's got to yeah. be agile. So the DevOps process is right in the middle of all of this. And when we go out and talk to customers about using OpenStack or any open source or any new software, it's the continuous integration and continuous delivery that they have to adapt to. So we always encourage them to understand they're in the middle of a transformation. This is a change in the way we think. They're delivering services to the business and they have to use these piece parts yeah. to make those services real. Yeah. So it, it's all about the agility and velocity of using this content to make them effective. Exactly right. So this is kind of interesting to bring up DevOps, I mean, especially when we talk about clouds, because I agree with the fundamental reasons for DevOps, but it was interesting because Seamus and team were just in here in the TS group talking about how they're moving away from using DevOps in the language with customers and trying to up-level the conversation, which I completely agree with. And I think there's a level of, of maturity that you get to where it's no longer about DevOps, it's about something larger, right? Which kind of speaks to that transformation. How does that conversation happen? When you start having a conversation about cloud, and this is where I, I just have a hard time wrapping my head around it. You have a conversation about cloud, but you want to talk about IT transformation. You do, I mean, there so, are a lot of dots between yeah, those two absolutely, statements. Absolutely, absolutely. So How do you, many, of our, many of the customers I'm working with today have multi-thread programs going on. They have a service management improvement program going on because they have to optimize those capabilities around operations in order to keep velocity where it needs to be to stay agile with all of this change in technology. The other stream they're doing is application modernization. So they're trying to understand how to migrate their apps into the cloud and ensure that they have the scale and capability that the apps need to run in the cloud. And another thread is cloud. It's now how do I build services that use cloud capability to deliver them? So you've got these three simultaneous actions going together driving these enterprises crazy about how the hell do I keep all this together on track. And we go in and talk to them about putting governance in place around these three programs. They have to integrate. They have to hand and glove work together. So that, that is the biggest challenge of all of this is, yes, we need open source. Absolutely, Helion is the pulse of everything. 
But the reality is customers won't be successful unless they take on this transformation and change the way they think. They're delivering services. That's, they have to stay relevant as an IT organization and broker services more than anything. So, I'm sure I've heard somebody earlier on say, uh, easily deploy. Maybe we're talking about workloads rather than open stack itself. But I also heard somebody say it makes your brain hurt as well. Um, what are HP doing with the Enterprise Edition to make it easier for the traditional enterprise customers? Because again, okay, you ran Rackspace open stack cloud, okay, well, Rackspace is full of like Linux nerds and people like tinkering. <laughs> but it is right, it, yeah, it's, you've got lots of them and developers and stuff, and most organizations don't have that kind of manpower, so would maybe look to HP and say, right, what are you going to do to insulate or protect me from that complexity of deployment? And, and a similar question would be, as you're you know, a major player within the OpenStack community, what kind of leverage do you have with upstream and stuff to say, look, We've got to take some of this complexity out of it to make it more viable for the people. So let me also speak to the first part and we talked about the open stack itself. So our our installer um, takes about about an hour to install you know 10, 10 15 machines. And um, everybody, I think pretty much everybody on our exec team have done it at this point. So salespeople done it, marketing people done it. Our COO, our COO did it. So I mean, set out, there's a set of instructions, do it. You don't have to be a Linux nerd to install the Enterprise Edition on you know, a set of machines. And so that's a big improvement. I mean, our first installer, you had to do that. I mean, kind of a, as we were building it, and we're like, okay, how do we take the set of steps, shrink them, shrink them, make them more automated, and we're gonna continue to make that simpler and simpler. And that's just a big part of our, our thesis. You can't have to be a, a Linux nerd to be able to install this, uh, it's just one, that's just not enterprise grade. Well, I think thing that's part of the disconnect too, right? Which is, if you look at look at the two groups, right? So you've got the ops infrastructure folks and you've got the app dev folks. The app dev folks understand code really, really well. The ops infrastructure folks, the furthest they go is typically into scripting, but they're not they're not developers. So they're not right. That's so, but we're now asking them to become developers to some degree if they truly want to play with some of the new methods. Or to ask developers to be called infrastructure <laughs> as well. But, as well. So but that's so. but that's actually let, let's let's be honest, that's actually so DevOps seems like it's a it's a new thing, right? But that's actually how it used to be. Like it used to be that if you were an ops guy yeah. You programmed in C from time to time. Like it was, there was no. I'm just an ops guy who only does scripting. That's that's a that, that's a, a more recent striation in our in our industry. And what we're doing is we're we're realizing that, that was a bad idea, um, and it's a bad idea to think of the ops guys as kind of like the the, the server janitors or whatever. Like they're they're actually. And it turns out when I go and sit with customers, I'm almost always very pleasantly surprised actually how many really Linux savvy people are actually in these these big enterprises when everybody tells me they don't really have you know they don't have these these sharp Linux guys that actually they do um, they're, they're actually a lot more of them than you think um, which is which is surprising like it's not a, it's not a thing we're 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 hearing or, or that we that we think of is that we've assumed that everybody's just you know they're all running Windows NT and so they can run Exchange and it it turns out that that's not a very interesting thing for for you know for ops guys to hack on all the time and so a lot of them have learned a lot about about either they knew Unix in the first place had to do this you know this this Windows crap for a, a period of time or they um, <laughs> you know or they they've been learning it uh, the you know o over the period so I don't think it's as, as cut and dry as as the enterprise doesn't have savvy uh, you know savvy folks I, I think that's processes in the enterprise processes so in the enterprise exactly it's not just and, and that's and that's one of the things that we were talking about with the business transformation it, it turns out you actually can't run a, a the type of you can't be a service provider and provide the services that your business needs if you just silo off all your IT departments into into tiny little little one trick ponies. Like your business then isn't agile enough to, to respond to its needs. So we have to help people uh, through yeah, that. Yeah, and I think there is a bleeding over anyway because you see even in any it doesn't matter whether it's enterprise or not. Where you, you have database people that are kind of bleeding into how those platforms perform, especially when it's virtualized. You have to you have to understand how that virtualization environment can affect that. That database, or that platform, or that that data warehouse. So when you, even if you section off that piece that says I, 
I'm going to deal with information and information management and, and databases. All of that kind of integration, all that kind of connectivity and that performance, those are kind of bleeding into each other now because you have to tune both the database and the platform to gain optimal performance. And that involves understanding the application, understanding the sophistication of the database, and knowing what that what that physical and virtual environment needs to look like to be able to support it. So, so that, that's, a, that's a big shift. That, that, that's a big shift in application development. So if you, if you kind of go back a few years, your application didn't have any concept of the hardware really it was running on. It was a set of scripts or a set of routines. It just did the things it executed. Today, any sophisticated cloud application has an area within that code that says, I know I'm running on 74 boxes and 18 queues and this stuff, and I'm adapting to that. So the application developer has turned its hardware configuration into a set of software routines and software configurations that allow it to dynamically interact in one or more data centers. And that's a, real, that's a really big shift in kind of application and code development, which started with the internet guys, you know, 10 plus years ago. Uh, but it is now kind of vastly more common. It's bringing apps and apps closer together. Yes. That's, expect, that's expected as part of this transformation. And one of the things that we're seeing when we go and implement um, services as part of this is as we're building up the services, building an automation center of excellence that does all this this coding or scripting. Mm -hmm. So we're putting governance in place around automation. Mm -hmm. And we're using open source, open stack, the Helion capability to be the basis for that establishing the governance. And I, I've seen, you know, walking into organizations that are trying to do private cloud, um, really struggling to get their domain owners, those SMEs around the different compute um, components to come together. So we've started to build this governance, and it's, it's similar to a service management office of the past when ITIL was the big parade, right? Now it's really all about automation and getting the velocity with all these um, automated parts. So. One, of the, one of the things <laughs> that I used to talk to people about um, is if you're touching, if you're manually doing scripts to get machines up and booted, I mean, first step is just tell everybody to stop doing that. Right. I mean, yeah. you just literally have to go. Everything has got to go into Public Chef or Salt or Ansel. One of these configuration scripts, because then you're turning the complex typing level stuff into a reusable asset, which then is repeatable and managed Absolutely. and governed. Yeah, and having standards around the templates themselves, mm -hmm. so yeah. naming conventions and so forth. So is this, a, is this kind of a knowledge base that clients can pull from? Is this a consulting engagement? Product. This is evolving, so at this point, I would say it's going to evolve into that knowledge base as the best practice and a standard. But right now, we're just seeing it come up in, in, in an infant stage and building up into probably more of a, a credible standard. I mean, arguably, in the industry, it's still it's still in its infancy around right. automation and orchestration, right? And yeah. so a lot of folks don't even understand what that really means. Yeah. With, with, without governing automation. We end up having systemic waste in the organizations. If you let everybody script do their own thing, VMs flying everywhere, right? You don't know what's where. Your, your operations on that side of operating and uh, taking care of business as an IT organization gets a little uh, disrupted because we're now like allowing folks to have the agility, but without control, it can get out of hand. But even the control mechanisms have to change, right? Oh, because things change from the platform so rapidly mm -hmm. that even some of the operational approaches to it, because you may gain some efficiencies, yep. that's something that someone discovers by a certain engagement with a customer or they may be developing in the lab, and that gets introduced so fast, but there's discipline. The discipline has to have flexibility enough that I can absorb best practices, publish, and then wait for the next best practice and publish and so on. So even from a support, Perspective, or if you're, mm -hmm. you're whether you're in IT or you're in the application development environment, that has to be a coordinated effort because if you stick to one and you say six months months from now I may change those operational procedures, you're going to lose that app developer environment because IT will be too slow and you know and too cumbersome to maintain it. So IT has to change at the same time to support that change. This is how IT stays relevant. Yeah. 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 So they move it, they move, go ahead. They move into an IT. A, a, a internal service provider model right. where they act like a, 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 a cloud provider to their folks. And they do chargebacks, they do, well, you get X quota of capacity if you need to burst more than that, just call this API and you'll get governed or, or approved it, within reason. And that allows the business units, the lines of business to be 
know, technology companies themselves and make use of a, of a pretty vast infrastructure. So I agree with all this, but where does the Helium product address that? Meaning, so how does how does Helion, to kind of bring this full circle yeah. back to why we're here. Sure, sure. Because um, all this is fascinating, I agree with the point is, the products and services piece, how does that really help you do that? From the Helion. From the Helion point of view, um, we see, if I talk to elaborate, people are starting to use Helion as the internal cloud for people that are making a transition to that service provider model. And so this provides end user applications to use you know, one or more a private instance of a Helion in the cloud. Right, so I, I think, it, so a classic example is banking, and you might run into a, a small bank or a big bank that may have 20 business units or 200 business units if you're the largest bank. And each business unit has applications that are very specific to the business outcomes they're trying to drive. And so what has been happening is, is that business unit will try to spin up its own cloud in its own environment. And the, and, and the risk becomes if you have 200 different clouds, which may be configured and operated and managed separately, there's huge risk to the parent company that has those 200 different business units. So if you use this type of Helium technology, you can literally have almost this base that you're launching these 40, 60, 80, 100 clouds from, and you've got that control mechanism that you can keep up with the pace of the changes in the business. Because you can rapidly be able to provision a, a new cloud from that, that kind of base cloud environment that can be controlled centrally. Yeah, but that's why all the business units spun up their own cloud in the first place, is because centralized IT couldn't do that. And now they can, is what we're saying, it's the difference. I, they, they could, if they were capable of doing it, and then I would argue that if they were capable of doing it, they would have done it already. So why, that there, there is a reason why business units go off and build their own IT department. Right. And that reason is because the existing IT department. So what you're talking about is a technology thing, and yes, the technology may be shiny and cool, <laughs> that's not the problem. It's not a technology problem, it's a people problem. It's always a people problem. Well, that's what Louise was talking about, which is transformation of, of IT, though, to a service provider model from a, a standalone individual SLA model to the business unit. Yeah, so because how, how does HP Helion actually help people with that? Because that shiny technology is one thing, but it's not magic. So what are the parts of HP Helion that actually make that transition easier for organizations, so, particularly IT providers? So Helion integrates to our cloud service automation platform as a catalog. And with that integration, we, have, we become that central point of contact to the customer so IT can offer services. And underneath that is the technology that pushes those services forward and gives the velocity of you know, generating a, a VM, right? Uh, managing storage and the, the, the capacity of the, the cloud itself. Uh, orchestrating processes. That's what Helion does underneath the service definition. And CSA, Cloud Service Automation, is that umbrella to you know, allow IT a window to the customer. But to extend that answer though, if you, Helion, underneath Helion itself, are, there are services groups. So it's a product plus it has services characteristics. So what, what you should expect from a professional services team is that they will be able to help define the service catalog, help define the processes around service management, understand the governance and be able to implement that type of government pro governance process that says you can do chargebacks, for example, that allow you to be able to react immediately to a demand to develop the portal concept so that so you can look at a screen and see, okay, I need to do, I need this kind of provisioned environment that I can work off of around these characteristics from the cloud. That's a that's a that's a people and process transformation. There's there's a whole service group that kind of enables that um, when those customers are really looking to do that transformation. And that's not instant. That's kind of that's gonna that's a process that they need to go through and it is, takes a little bit of time. Is that service group within Helion? Within the Helion yes. organization? Yes. Okay. That's, that's <laughs> it's all him. He's the entire services group. Well, the no, resource I'm asking is, so you talk about transformation, you talk about services. I'm trying to differentiate between, so I'm a customer. When do I go to healing on services versus TS versus software services? I mean, they seem like silos. Right? Well, in the, in but the there's a brokerage we can do within the company. Right. So from, from my perspective, you know, I handle a certain component that I deliver directly, but for, for our customers, for the cloud customers, this is a, just like you do anything else. We bring the service teams together to be able to enable that. Because we've got very talented and, and very specific skills that are around the physical base of the platform. As, you know, 
as Lisa was mentioned, there's very talented and very gifted people that are around certain software components of that data and I mean, process. Yeah, it's, we're a, an it's a collaborative. We are group. an integrated team, one face to the customer. We don't expect the customer to, to navigate all of the different services organizations because we're doing this together. It's, it's, right. a, it's a one HP thing. And oftentimes, I mean, Oftentimes we're led through your team, right? And then as you guys see, there's some transformation. Well, you talk, you, right. you pull, you pull people, the right people, right? right. So it's they, that that idea of Hulan is all about that because HP is pretty unique in terms of being able to bring all those service requirements so, together. So if I had a dozen customers sitting here, would they agree with that statement of the integration of the services? I you think so. As of late, as, as of late, I mean, so we've been growing up along the way, right? And, and I think we're doing a much better job than we were doing six months ago. Right. Even. So it's, a, it's a nicer way of saying, you know, who else would say that? Right? Of IP, but it's a way to validate, you know, a way from the silo, because that's, that's a challenge. I have two customers that here are here, and they're not in the room, that would say that, that I've been working okay. together with and working together within HP to execute. And we're, yeah. doing, we're doing fine. Yeah, even in the U.S., there's big retailer, a big bank, you know, and, and, and well, how, actually, big manufacturer how many customers roughly do you have within the production then? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, numbers I think are changing all the time, and it, you know, I don't know if I'm really comfortable in saying 10, how many. 100, okay. Well, it's less than 100,000, yeah. No, 10. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty comfortable in saying yeah, it's 10. less than 100,000. Yeah, but more than 10. Yeah, but more than 10. Hey, you mentioned earlier um, the enterprise needs to get its head out of the mindset of I installed something, I upgraded it three years, four years, five years later, and obviously open stacks ticking over every six months. Are you saying that that's the new norm, that we've got to get our heads totally out of it, right? We deploy and we stroke it for three years and then we upgrade it. Is this the new world we're living where we're constantly upgrading our infrastructure? Yes. yes. We have Absolutely. I think I think six months yeah. is too. I've been I've been arguing inside of OpenStack to get rid of the six month releases and go to a rolling model completely because nobody that runs big nobody that runs big infrastructure releases for real nobody is doing six month deployments nobody is doing three year deployments because they're insane they're, it, it doesn't work and it's not what anybody's customers want nobody says oh my god check it out Google upgraded today. When's the last time that you, you've said that to yourself? Nobody says that. It doesn't happen. Mozilla's ran, run, running with a, with a rolling upgrade for, for Firefox. And how, you know, uh, Chrome is doing this. Google's doing the same thing with Chrome. It works with, with your Android phone. All of these things are, that are like, you know, talking about something that's part and parcel to somebody's daily life and getting stuff done is, oh, I, you know, nobody wants to go and think about upgrading their web browser. These, and these are the reasons that the people who were doing longer and longer releases became irrelevant. Who's the, when's the last time you heard anybody talk about how awesome Internet Explorer is? Well, no, and then they finally caught up with the, with the rolling release model. It's people want change. People need to respond to business things in five years is, is too long. It doesn't so like work. I totally get that with like yeah. a browser or something, but when it's like a complicated infrastructure. If your complicated infrastructure is too complicated for you to upgrade, you did something wrong. Okay, but... Facebook upgrades ten times a day, and it's more complicated than any enterprise app you've got out there. Stop! Stop! <laughs> this is not relevant. I'm sorry. This is why not? This is, Facebook is not relevant. Google is Facebook not relevant is perfectly to the relevant. Average enterprise. Okay. Thing. Here's the thing: How many people are as happy with their enterprise app and the way that it works as people are with Facebook and how it delivers the, the are, thing? Do you have any idea how complicated the back-end data warehousing is on, on Facebook and how well they do? They have the huge Facebook, amounts of data. The point here is the Facebook application, yeah. right? The Google set of applications yeah. are not representative of the core enterprise applications that you see in an average enterprise. Right. It's a much more complicated environment. I, no, I, 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 do not give, I do not give you that last one. It is not more complicated. I it, guarantee you that Facebook is more complicated than any enterprise application you find out there. Well, I, yes, but it's because it's <laughs> a lot of thousand applications, lots of little applications within yeah. every bank or every yeah, thread. Right. Like Google is, okay, it's a lot, but it's, it's search, right? And Facebook is an, a huge app. And I, I'll guarantee you that yeah. Google and Facebook have much smarter developers and much Sure, but this is the reason they've been doing it for ten years already. Like they're they're the they're the they're the wave that I mean, enterprise is never going. You're exactly right. Enterprise isn't going to be Google and Facebook directly, but we know that 
they've they've got those those smarter tier of, of developers, and we know that those are they've they've been they've been because they've got huge applications to run that are extremely complicated. The thing that they have figured out is the only way for them to keep up with that is is to do this this sort of sort of methodology. And there's a reason the rest of the industry is tracking where they're going and what they're doing. So as we're bringing cloud to people, part of that is being able to provide enterprises the same way to start to think about how they might be able to do something in as agile and reactive a, a, a manner as well, Google and Facebook. I so let's just put it that. If you want to put it reality, it's going to take some time. That's going to take some time. We're all Google. But it happens today, though. So yeah. you can look at, at, at a classic example in, in the finance group. So you've got web banking, and you have retail banking, and you have you have Applet or you have on your on your mobile device. You know, you've got you've got online banking, and then you have the Applet banking. That those Applets, just like anything else, are being updated in a continuous way. Mm -hmm. The the foundational infrastructure that supports it is being tuned and optimized as those applications are being are being treated. So there is almost a rolling optimization, if you want to call it that way, as opposed to a rolling upgrade. They're continuously optimizing that environment, and if if you get to that cycle where you're continuously up, um, modifying within Juno, right, and the next Kilo's coming along, so you're planning that continuous upgrade for the next version that comes out, and then you introduce that in a parallel way, and then you adopt, and then you start rolling the management and optimization. That, that optimization for the application base is gonna continue to happen for IT. So that mindset has to change, where you're not saying, I'm planning, and I'm gonna take six months to plan for that next upgrade, because you're getting application changes on a daily basis, yeah. an application requirement. So you're thinking, okay, what do I need to do? And you're continuously doing that. And there may be a two-week delay, there may be a 10-day delay as you're going through the testing. Because in the enterprise, it's got to be perfect, <laughs> it's got to be available, yeah. and I can't make a mistake. Yeah. So ju just for me, so Helium will track every release of OpenStack, right? It's not going to be like, because I remember when you first mentioned Helium um, in Vegas, well, that was the first time I heard about mm -hmm. it. And I was trying to think, right, so is it going to be like the red hat of the Linux world, right, where RHEL 5 was, sorry, RHEL 6 was like the latest version until four or five months ago, right? And it was running on a 2.6 kernel, which is, I don't know, 10 years old, but red hat was insulating the enterprise customers from all of the, you know, the, the latest kernel revs and stuff. They, they would pick a stable kernel and say, we're going to build an enterprise platform around that, right? And I, I at the time, thought that Helium would like, say, take, Juno or something and say, right, this is what we're going to totally get that I'm like last year, right? <laughs> okay. And I'm just making sure that yeah. I get this right. So you're not going to take a version of OpenStack and say, right, this is going to be our stable platform for the next couple of years and we'll skip a few releases and it's not going to be like that now. No, we're not, we're not going to be skipping. Uh, right, we're not going to okay. be skipping a couple of years. No, now, gonna... now, and we're not committing to, you know, one day after the next letter release to have another enterprise version of that. Yeah. We're trying to make sure we've got good, solid bits. And so, I mean, we've been both in OpenStack about four years now. We know that there's points where it's deeply unstable during the cycle. There's times when it gets much more stable. Yeah. And we're kind of tracking to those vintages, kind of months. And like, we like those, we want to get, and they're pretty predictable, 100%. We like those, we like to build against those, and QA and make sure they're really stable. At what point does, HP take a, um, I think the right way to phrase this, take a broader responsibility in the development of OpenStack. I don't mean just from the contribution standpoint, but in terms of development, direction, strategy. I mean, that's one of the challenges of the foundation today, mm -hmm. that, right? It's, um, in Rackspace, my opinion is Rackspace was doing the right thing in terms of taking the lead for that. Um, I think they back. They had to back yes. off from it, but they backed yeah. off too far. Okay. Someone needs to step in. Is HP that that person to step we, in? And we, we are definitely take that? we're definitely leaning in. And so whether we're the only person or not, we are with our contributions, with mm -hmm. the ETLs, with the number of people we brought on kind of in the last in the last year. Yeah. We are really trying to make sure that we're making it more and more effective <laughs> for the kind of enterprise cases that we have that our, that our customers are trying to support. Yeah. And we've got the you know we've we've got the um, we've got the right the right seeds in there. We've got you know five of the five of the technical committee members are, are HP employees. Uh, you know work on work on my team. Um, we're 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 making sure that we've got the ability to do that, but not in a, not necessarily just in a short sort of like exactly what you said. Strategy, making sure that we've got direction in there because 
you know, just being able to land the patch in a particular cycle, okay, that's great, but that's that's kind of table stakes to being able to make, okay, we need to we need to look at a three year direction. Where are we gonna be in three years? Which means you you've gotta be you've gotta be in, you've gotta be vested, right? So it, it takes a bit and we've we've been doing that over the last couple of years is making sure we've got guys who are who are in there who are working who are, who are who are building up the you know the, the credibility that's needed so that so that we we have the right channels to to, to bring those those needs to, to bear. And I think that's important. I think that if you look at the way kind of the open community is evolved, it, it it needs a bit of a there's a conversation around the longer term view, kind yeah. of the one to two year view. And mm -hmm. a number of us have had that certainly in, in the kind of in the beginning we laid out some visions for what we thought it needed to be in the next ten year or two. It's like I did a keynote in Bear at the Bear Summit. And it's like, this is all the stuff I need, because I was trying to build a cloud. And you know, lo and behold, 18, 24 months later, we had pretty much all that. Yeah. And so it's, I think there needs to be a bit more of that vision casting of like, what is the, can, what are the, our, the potential customers need from OpenStack you know, in the T plus two year time frame? And uh, part of the reason I'm, I'm here is that I believe that HP is a company that can be positioned to hear enough of those inputs to make this a big impact in the enterprise. There's um, uh, at the last summit uh, there was a uh, 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 the first meeting of a group that a terrible name but they were calling themselves the the hidden influencers um, uh, but uh, but but it was the idea that that we need to and this is actually something that um, uh, a couple folks uh, uh, so one person Allison Randall who who works for me but then also um, uh, who you may know from you know past as past things as running technical architecture for Ubuntu, things of that nature. So she's working for me now. She was one of the people, uh, along with, with Rob Hirschfeld and, uh, and Sean Roberts, that, that put that together. The idea is that we've got 250 companies that are all collaborating at the development level, right? And, and they, we've got that figured out, right? We know how to make sure that companies who even technically hate each other, you know, are collaborating on, on, on the same thing. But we kind of need that same collaboration at the product management level. And so we're trying to take a real leadership role in, uh, in in that, to, to be able to, to broker those conversations and to um, to make sure that this isn't just a whole bunch of random developers putting patches into the same thing, but that there is there's a strategy that's got a it's got a plan that's gonna meet people's product roadmap needs and it's gonna ultimately meet customer needs. Because I mean, the way I think about this, the reason why I'm so interested in OpenStack, number one, I'm very supportive of OpenStack, but because I think it presents a um, a nice alternative to VMware as well as, that's not to say that VMware is a crappy product, I'm just saying it gives you choice, right? Mm -hmm. But the concern I have is that Helion's success, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, Helion's success rises and sets with the success of OpenStack. If OpenStack succeeds, Helion can flourish. Mm -hmm. If OpenStack fails or stumbles, that's, I, it's going to create a pretty significant problem for HP's cloud strategy. It's totally wrong. Yep. So, right? Yeah, totally, yeah, that's part of the yeah, So, yeah, OpenStack failing or OpenStack going into a, a ditch, obviously, you know, not, not the place any of us ever want to go. I think part of that is, I think right now, there's we've got more of the large companies realizing how much of their enterprises are based on this. If you look at you know, people like eBay and Yahoo, and a lot of the, the people that are more, much more on the consumer side, I mean, I came out of Yahoo, so when we started conversations with them four years ago, they're like, this is nowhere near as good as our internal stuff. So in a couple of years it should be, and now we're a couple of years later, and it's like now more and more of Yahoo's own internal cloud technologies is based on that. So the more you get these larger companies, whether they're enterprise or tech companies, to build on this, they're all pushing in requirements and needs and solutions to make this stuff work and not not go into that ditch with yeah. the Everybody needs it to succeed, right? But the right set yeah. goes to Amazon and to your Lord. Like the whole market, it's the yeah. need yeah. to succeed. Yeah, it, it has to succeed. And, and that's one of the reasons that it's not, we're, that, that we're not just pushing uh, you know the success of, of Helion on itself. It's if if somebody if somebody out there like you know at, at, again at the summit, uh, Bloomberg gave a really great presentation on the stuff that they're doing. Right? They're not they're not buying Helion from us, and, and but that's fine. Like it's it's good for the ecosystem. It's it's great that they took now they they took some technology that, that we that we built uh, the the ironic uh, stuff was a project that we started to do the bare metal stuff and Bloomberg now they took their internal stuff they were using for that tossed it out and they're using that now right and so it's these things these times so that's that's great and all the stuff they're doing there then that feeds back in so it, it's a it, there's a virtuous cycle here 
So for us to make it better for the industry, that's great, right? And then, and then like I said, we, we build the, the product on top of that for the people for whom that's a, that's a value and they'll be extremely happy with, with those things. So all of those things need to be successful. Hey, is there anything <coughs> open stack or alien um, around automation and orchestration of containers like Docker and things like that? So our dev, our dev yeah. platform. We've got a dev platform. So um, our, our, our the Helan dev platform is is based on on Cloud Foundry. So there's a there's a pretty big bet, bet we're making there, and we've we've started um, we've been we've been involved in the formation of the of the Cloud Foundry uh, Foundation. Uh, we've got uh, got some folks sitting on the on the sort of formation committee of that. Week. Oh great! So uh, so maybe I'm not. Uh, <laughs> it's, wait, it's, there's a it's reason. It's, it'll be on it'll be on the December the 9th, but that's. No one knows. Excellent. <laughs> okay. There's a reason they that I don't always talk to the press. Um, so uh, so we're really um, involved in that. But there's other things like you mentioned Docker. Um, you know, I'm, I so I run a, a really big uh, uh, cloud application. So the the, the OpenStack developer infrastructure itself is an OpenStack application that runs on top of OpenStack. So I I not only do I work on OpenStack, I run things on top of it, and all of those great uh, happy things. Um, and, and we're actually inside of that looking right now at, okay, what are some of the workloads that we're doing that using Docker on top of OpenStack makes sense in? We had a great chat with, um, with Eric Windisch, uh, who used to work on, on OpenStack, is now working at Docker, about you know, the, the, the Nova Docker integration and, and what, is, what does Docker look like as a, uh, as a, as a vert layer for, for OpenStack. The same, at the same level, at our dev platform, guys, we've got, uh, we've got those guys are doing dev work now in making sure that Cloud Foundry is integrating appropriately with, with OpenStack and also integrating appropriately with Docker. And so all of these things ultimately form a story because depending on what your application is, maybe it makes sense in a, in a set of Docker containers, maybe it makes sense as a Cloud Foundry workload, maybe that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, you know, and maybe maybe what you do need is you need automated bare metal deployment that also looks like Cloud. So maybe, maybe you wind up with an infrastructure that looks like a bare metal cloud, a VM cloud, and some and some container-based workload management things also, and that those can coexist in an ecosystem that doesn't drive people crazy. Um, and so th this is the place that, that everything wants to be. You know, all of these are moving really really quickly, and you know, who knows? Maybe Rocket from from uh, from the the core OS guys will wind up being useful. No idea. It's way too early to to actually know whether that's anything other than them shifting because Docker is eating their business lunch. Um, uh, I should stop talking again. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say just want to say the official name of the product because they get very upset is the HP Helion Development Platform. Yeah. If you say anything else, believe me, there's like people with spears that attack you. I've been hit by one of those spears. They're not. They're not and very comfortable. So, so it is the official HP Helion Development Platform. Yeah. <laughs> I know in our, our, our internal cloud community, Docker's been a one of the big topics. So I know in our organization we're at experimenting with it. So I, I see it as part of an integral part of implementations across our customers. Oh, absolutely. And I think, <coughs> the, at least I am, and I think the market is concerned that you know, we've got VM sprawl and all that kind of stuff in our states. Now we're going to end up with container sprawl. Mm -hmm. You know, in the hood early on. And how could, I mean, I know there's like Kubernetes and all this kind of stuff that's out there, but I was just curious where you guys are going and yeah. where you see it going. Well, even on the side, interesting you mentioned, you mentioned uh, Kubernetes. There's um, so in inside of the sort of larger Triple O ecosystem, there's a set of guys working on a project called Cola, um, which is which is looking at can we use Kubernetes in in part of an OpenStack deployment uh, environment. And they're, they 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 get some good success early on. They've they've hit some they've hit some issues because it turns out that nothing, not even Kubernetes, solves all the world's problems. Um, but but it's really all of these things are definitely like definitely hot hot topics and are are actively being worked. So that's um, that's some exciting exciting work that those guys are doing. Well, it's a pause. So just to let you know, we have about seven more minutes. So I mean, fantastic discussion. It's not been very engaging. Not at all. As I said, I was concerned with all the introverts sitting in the room. So you know, in these final minutes, if you really do have a question. No. Please, please feel free to take any cool stickers. We have the HP Helion stickers at our booth. They're not cool. They're not cool ones. 
natural one. Now, I used to have that blue Julian sticker and I've peeled it off down here and yeah. it's left a dirty great big mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the open crowbar, are you guys familiar with the crowbar? Yeah. yeah. And now it's open crowbar. And then, just yeah. because I have to have my loyalty, forget KBM, it's trash. I have my Zen. Zen. You better. Zen. Zen. You better. Oh, Zen can be a manager. Yeah, you better watch out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come kick you in the face. Old, it's technology for lit. Come on, Zen is where it's at. Yeah, Zen is, Zen is, Zen is killing me right now. Um, so <laughs> don't even, don't even get me started on that. Um, if, if they didn't have any questions, there was one thing that I wanted, that I wanted my team to quickly uh -oh. go through is this idea of how they actually do use OpenStack for the entire development of environment. How it's a hybrid local cloud. Is that interest for the last few minutes for him to click that? But I mean, isn't that a kind of drink when you're on the champagne? Yeah, but, but it's, it's kind of interesting right. here. It's a pretty massive application. It's pretty yeah. unbelievable what they run. So we're, I mean, just the, the, the couple numbers that I can I can throw out there off the, off the top of my head. Um, so we have, we have around 2,000 developers uh, working on OpenStack, right? So they, they produce a, an enormous amount of uh, of code, which is great, uh, except if you're tasked with actually receiving and testing all, all of that code. Um, so we um, we actually we actually process and land about 10,000 changes to OpenStack every 42 days, um, which is which is kind of a, a, a monumentally insane thing when you consider that for every for every change and and that's that's final finished changes. Most of those go through 10, 12 revisions themselves before they before they landed. For every one of those, we spin oh, no. up. Sorry, the, not HP. That's the OpenStack. Community. Yeah, OpenStack community. Um, uh, in, oh, so the OpenStack community has 2,000. Yes. 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 Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, for each of those changes, we oh. we actually s spin up and deploy um, between between six and ten uh, complete OpenStack clouds for for every single one of those changes. So uh, we do that on top of uh, our 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 development infrastructure runs across uh, HP and Rackspace's public clouds. Uh, so it is a it is a multi-cloud hybrid cloud application that's been running in production for a couple of years. Um, we do all that dynamic, dy fully dynamically and, and fully, uh, uh, you know, it's 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 load driven. So the the more people happen, the more VMs we spin up. Uh, we spin up and tear down between ten and twenty thousand VMs a day, um, because uh, that's that's what's needed uh, to to support doing the full integration testing uh, of of OpenStack. We also have a couple of uh, quote private clouds. So we've got um, there's a there's a rack of servers at uh, at HP and a rack of servers at, at Red Hat uh, that are each running um, uh, running a triple O based uh, cloud that aren't public clouds. Those are those are there specifically for testing some of the harder uh, bare metal uh, pieces of, of the puzzle. So and we treat all of those the same. So we actually have in production and it's been running in production for quite a while an application that is actually running across pri public and private clouds. Uh, multiple uh, multiple vendors of, of each of those, and that and that's that's running it, its reality. Um, uh, in fact, if that stops running, um, uh, it, it the, the OpenStack uh, project stops. Uh, and the best part about there's 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 five five root admins that, that run all of that. So um, because because this is the this is sort of the power of of rampant automation and and cloud. And I mean, the, the, the DevOps team that's supporting that is, is not very big. No, it's so five. Yeah, that's yeah, it. So. Five people. Um, so, uh, so that's it. Th those are the sorts of the sorts of things that you that you can do. Um, you're right. Yeah, we're you know th there's some things that we've uh, you know obviously we make the choice to to only use OpenStack things because we're OpenStack and so it would be silly to to not do that. Um, and that works. Like we that's all that's all 100. Like we don't we don't use it <laughs> for either, with either of one of our, our public clouds if they've got a, a vendor specific extension we don't touch it. Um, because because we're we're supporting the OpenStack project, right? So so you can actually just using OpenStack right now, uh, this this works and has been working for us for, for quite some time. Um, so and that's uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty. Kind of that, yeah, I mean, most of these a number of these large open source projects build their own tooling. The internet yeah. itself is quite sophisticated. And so a two thousand person dev team is you know, certainly up the largest scale of any. Yeah. And, and in fact, actually, for, for another piece of context for any of you guys who know, um, I, I normally don't like doing uh, direct comparisons, but uh, this one's fun because um, it's not really a value judgment. We're we're at our development, uh, our the OpenStack development uh, uh, environment uh, is is actually uh, twice the total size of Travis CI. Um, so if you're familiar with that service, uh, they they support tons and tons of projects on on GitHub. 
you, know, you can just sign up and, and get CI testing. We, we actually have twice their, their, their aggregate size uh, just to support OpenStack. So, um, and, that's all, and that's all running on, on OpenStack. So for, for sort of size and scope uh, you know, comparisons is you know, how, how many VMs is that actually? What, what, what kind of size that's that's the, that's the scope. Yeah, it's a lot of VMs. <laughs> just, just curious, yeah. as a side, do you know how that compares with some of the initial Linux work that was done? You know, because there's always this comparison of, okay, well, we went through this exercise in Linux, so yeah. now we're doing it with OpenStack. And then, you know, it just kind of dawned on me, so, is it a scale problem in addition to a complexity? I know it's a complexity It is. Issue. It's a complexity issue and, and a scale <laughs> issue. The, the thing is, is that the number of, the number of developers and, and the, the rate of change of, of, of that number, so like the, you know, the second derivative or whatever is, 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 kind, of, is kind of extremely high and, and been one of the things we've been dealing with. James Bottomley, um, uh, uh, who's one of the, the kernel core guys and um, uh, works for what, Parallels or, or whatever now, uh, he, he actually came to the, the latest OpenStack Summit and, and was, it was actually come to the last couple. Uh, and, and he, he was, I'm, I would never say we're, we're at, a, at a larger uh, developer base than Linux myself, but that was actually something that, that he was saying, that he thinks that we're, we're actually uh, bigger in those terms. Now, the thing is, is they're completely different pieces of software. So doing a direct apples to apples comparison on a, a you know, piece of cloud controller software written in Python and, and, and an operating system kernel that's been around for 20 years. Uh, the, the, I agree. Yeah, the development there speed is a very weird. That very yeah, comparison. it's a, it's a very strange comparison. Yeah, but there's um, a lot more corporate involvement, though, surely in you know, OpenStack than there was in at least the early days. In the early days of, of, of Linux, yeah. So, I, but once I, you got to you know Linux, circa 2000, the 99 2000s, yeah. it was corporate. I mean, IBM. It was. It was. A lot of people it don't. was. But they, yeah. the other problem we were talking about this this morning, the people who are working on OpenStack by far and large were never in the workforce during the Linux days. And the early by, large, by large, by yeah, yeah a large right. pool, yeah. right? Yeah. So a lot of those learnings are lost. Right? I don't think they're, I think they're very different yeah. learnings. I mean, people who well, are, there's that too. Yeah. But I'm saying that again, it's another example of where you, you can't compare the two. You can't compare right? the two. I, I think there's also there's there's a lot of times where. Especially a couple of years ago, we were having some some development, you know, growth pains or whatever, and people come in and say, "Well, why don't you just do what Linus does?" We're like, "Well, that would be that w that's a great idea. Like, what a thank you for your your suggestion." Um, uh, but but actually, the, uh, what a lot of those guys missed is that those of us who put together the the sort of initial structure and and and, and things around. Uh, OpenStack. Actually, most of us came from either Ubuntu, uh, had been had been building Ubuntu for for the last several years before OpenStack, or MySQL. Um, those were those are the, the 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 largest pools of people. So we actually have a whole bunch of uh, of long term open open source uh, DNA that are that are you're feeding in that. And but the problem space is a bit different. So the the actual solutions that 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 Linus took for the Linux kernel, while we can learn from them in general, the, the specific solutions aren't, aren't necessarily as, as applicable. Yeah. Um, so we, we do try our best to learn from, from them. We've been, we've been learning from, from you know, we, we took some things for, from Google and how they, how they run the, the Android project, uh, but also from, from, uh, from Ubuntu and, um, and MySQL. And so we're, we're sort of trying to take best of breed there, but also we have some challenges that are new and we've had to solve some, some new things. So it's a, cool. it's a bit of a, a mixed bag there. So Thank you guys very much. Great questions. The Twitter discussion is really good. It's all in CrowdChat. So you can hit one link and pretty much see the whole discussion. Even us arguing about programming languages. Which is oh, good. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for all the questions. And I want to thank you know the speakers who came here. It's actually difficult for me to get people based on schedule. And I really appreciate getting all these senior people here today for you guys. And I know that it was a really good interaction. And it should be an interaction. It doesn't always have to be a love fest. But you know, at the next event, we can celebrate the greatness of HP Helion. Yeah. We will all be convinced, <laughs> and, uh, and it'll just be it'll be nice. But thank you again. And again, <laughs> <again, laughs> if all of you, if you all have my card, if you didn't let me know before we head out, please contact me. I'm your liaison to all the cloud people, and I can put you in touch with anyone you need if you have questions. It's part of my role. And um, enjoy the rest of the show, which I think is two more hours before it shuts down and the great bus and the taxi wow. disaster happens. Oh my so god, the good. line outside for the, the get one of the most amazing things I've ever, I've never seen anything more amazing than that taxi line. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thanks for having me.
Twitter feed is very funny. Oh, that's, that's good. There's always a separate discussion oh, sure going good. on there, so it's good. Oh, yeah. Yeah.